Hello everybody, I hope you're enjoying this uh, DevOx edition. Hope it's uh, groovy, right? So this is, uh, I'm Guillaume Laforge. I'm going to speak about uh, the journey of the, the groovy programming language project uh, through uh, the open, so open source land. Um, so I work for uh, a company called uh, Restlet, uh, which is uh, working in the realm of uh, APIs. We have different uh, projects and products around web APIs, and I'm doing a talk on uh, REST API design right, a right after this one. So if you want to check out our um, projects and products, uh, you can have a look uh, on restlet.com. And uh, as this is about um, the Groovy programming language, uh, I'd like uh, to tell you that there's a special promo code for those who want to uh, buy the Groovy in Action book, uh, the second edition, which was released like six months ago or something like that. Um, so it's uh, revised for the latest and greatest Groovy. Um, and, it's, uh, and it now weighs uh, in about nine, 900 pages, so it's quite a thick uh, book. Uh, but you, you'll get uh, all the latest and interesting bits in there. And uh, if you buy it, I'll, I'll, get, uh, I'll get like 50 cents per book. So I might be getting rich if I sell like a million. Or I don't know. But not sure that's going to be the, the right number of uh, editions we'll be able to sell. Anyway, so we'll go a little bit through the, the history of the, of the project and all the additions, uh, its inceptions and features, etc. So if we uh, look back into the past, in 2003, that's when Groovy was born, it was made by uh, Bob McQuarter and Jem Strachan. Bob McQuarter is uh, quite well known for things like Jebor's Drools, so it's not his first, uh, it wasn't his first uh, uh, open source project and Jem Strachan is also known for um, uh, service mix, ActiveMQ and uh, some Apache Commons projects etc. And uh, back in 2003 Jems uh, was chatting with his friend Bob and uh, was saying you know wouldn't it be groovy if we could do this and that in Java and uh, he was inspired by languages like Python, Smalltalk, Ruby, etc. And f he felt like, you know, we could do something cool um, in Java. But, you know, <laughs> it's hard to, um, let's say, influence Java, right? Uh, so the idea came to release and invent and create a brand new language that runs on the JVM. So that's how, uh, in August uh, 2003, James Strachan created uh, Groovy and announced it on, the, on his blog. Uh, why he did that, uh, the inspiration, etc. And even in that uh, pre-104, uh, Groovy was already pretty much looking like like what it's looking like now. And uh, in 2003, we we already had closures, right? And it was working on uh, uh, Java 1.4. I'm not sure we. Perhaps it was even working on Java 1.3 at the beginning. No, or it was 1.4. Anyway, doesn't matter much. But yeah, we had closures more than 10 years ago in on the JVM. That was nice. So the inspiration came from uh, Python, Ruby, Smalltalk, and uh, otherwise, in, I mean, in terms of syntax, that that was actually the the Java syntax that we derived into a new grammar for uh, uh, supporting Java itself uh, as, uh, I mean like copy and paste uh, compatibility somehow, uh, like 95% perhaps of uh, Java code is also valid Groovy code because of how we derived the, the Groovy syntax, the Java syntax into the Groovy syntax. And on top of that, we did tons of uh, useful uh, methods uh, to simplify the, the Java code base, uh, to add missing methods to JDK classes and things like that. And uh, it was dynamically typed only, uh, but later on we, we also added static typing and uh, static type inference, etc., and static compilation. So in uh, 2003, uh, pretty much mm, at the beginning of the project, I joined the, the project 
so I had some some vacations and uh, I had the need for uh, integrating some scripting scripting capabilities into the project I was working on at that time. And uh, during my vacations, I was like, "Oh, there's this new cool shiny toy. Let me play with it." So I downloaded it and I quickly noticed that there were some issues with things like uh, um, Unicode support, internationalization and things like that. And uh, I had some spare time on hand and uh, I looked at the code. Oh, but it's obvious they made a, a mistake there. So, okay, it's open source. Why not suggest some, some improvements. Uh, so I contributed patches, patches after patches. And uh, Jim Strachan has asked me to, to become the, the committer, a committer on the project because he was fed up of applying my commits one after the other. Uh, but later on, so it's more in 2004 actually, but later on, uh, uh, the, the, the initial project founders, Bob and James, left the project and moved on to uh, other projects. And that's how I, I actually became the lead of the project uh, in uh, around 2004. So in 2004, uh, that's when Facebook was born. Uh, yeah, that was looking, you know, something like that. Uh, that was also the time for Java 5. Yeah, Java 5. In um, 2004, we uh, added a new parser. So there, there have been a few rewrites of the Groovy parser uh, over the years. And this new parser was, uh, so there were actually two hand-rolled parsers before moving to an Antler-based parser. Uh, and the, the, the changes were um, c contributed by uh, John Rose and Jeremy Rayner. John, John Rose, that's the guy who uh, worked on the Invoke Dynamic support uh, for the JVM, by the way. That's also the year where Jochen uh, Theodor, best known as uh, Black Drag, is a uh, nickname, uh, joined the project. So uh, after me, that's the second uh, longest uh, committer on, on the project. And uh, something that was funny was that already in 2004, there were already folks saying, okay, this is the end of Groovy, the sinking ship, it's not uh, you know, gaining any traction, etc. And that was a blog post on the bio blog. Who remembers the bio blog? So it's more for older Java developers. Anyway, uh, not, not really uh, important as we shall see later on. In 2005, the first flight of the Airbus A380, but that's also the year where the Grails web framework was uh, really uh, created, at least. I don't remember the, uh, the, the first release. In 2006, some <laughs> uh, soccer fans will remember what happened on the in that, uh, well, on that year. In 2006, uh, there was Java 6, and that was the first year where a full-time committer, be, uh, be, uh, a, a committer became a full-time paid uh, committer on the project. Uh, my uh, my friend Johan uh, was that guy, that lucky guy. So, uh, Big Sky Technology—that's the the company behind the No Fluff Just Stuff tour of conferences in the U.S. For those who know. In 2007, the release of the iPhone, that's also when we decided to go 1.0. It took us four years to go to Groovy 1.0, uh, but we really had some high-level standards of what we wanted, a 1.0 version of Groovy, uh, what, what it should be like. And uh, by experience and also by looking at all the, at all the languages, we noticed that um, a language really needs at least three, four years to become good enough, usable enough, uh, and useful enough, because otherwise things are a bit too flaky, um, syntax changes, API changing, etc. Uh, you need some time to mature uh, such a project. A language project really needs several years before really uh, be right for a prime time. Um, we, uh, with uh, Graham Roshi, the guy leading the the the, the, the Grail project, as well as with uh, Alex Katchman, we uh, created a company called G21, uh, which was dedicated to uh, Groovy and Grail's um, support, uh, product projects, etc. 
That same year, that was the inception of the Gretel build uh, tool automation. And that was also the first year where, where there was a dedicated conference for Groovy and Grails. And w that, was that was called Grails Exchange. Later it, it, it became Groovy and Grails Exchange. But that, was <coughs> that was the first conference on, on Groovy. And it's not all. 2007 was uh, quite a busy year. That was also the year where the Spock testing framework was conceived. Um, and what else? Uh, that was the year where we released GRI 1.5 with the long-awaited Java 5 support, annotations, enums, generics, etc. That's also when we released the joint compiler so that you can uh, joint compile Java and Groovy sources at the same time. So you can mix and match Groovy and Java sources together. You know, a Java interface implemented in Groovy, extended in Java, etc. You can do that kind of circle, uh, circle, circular language dependency uh, between your classes and interfaces. Uh, plus some other cool things. Um, Paul King, uh, the, the, the most prolific uh, Groovy committer joined the, the project as well in 2007 and really became the big number one committer uh, since the beginning of the project. 2008, Bienvenue chez les in, in French, the, the movie, for those who know that movie. Uh, that was also the creation of the Great Conf uh, series of conference, first in uh, Denmark. In 2007, <coughs> The G21 company, my small uh, startup, was acquired by Spring Source, so we joined the Spring Source uh, team. Uh, we had Griffin for uh, uh, a new project for uh, uh, desktop applications, EasyB, a behavior driven development uh, library for uh, your testing needs. Uh, that, uh, th there was also a fork uh, of Groovy called Groovy++ by my former uh, teammate uh, uh, Alex Katman. Uh, interestingly, that was actually already the third fork of the project. There, there have been at least three forks of the project, uh, three or four, I don't remember. But it's quite difficult to um, uh, fork a project and make it successful. But at least uh, what Alex had been working on, static compilation, uh, was a very, very interesting playground for the, the, the support of static type checking and static compilation that we later added to uh, Groovy. 2009, there was a famous quote uh, by James Strachan, uh, the original founder, who said that he might have uh, not created Groovy if he had known about Scala before. Perhaps you've heard about that uh, quote, which was a bit misleading and put out of context by uh, Scala fanboys especially. You know, it's a bit like if you had uh, a guy like Gavin King saying, you know, if there had been JPA when I created Hibernate, I wouldn't have created Hibernate, which is true. I invent the pretty much the, the same thing with the same advanced features. And back to uh, Gems. So he started with Groovy, moved to a bit of Scala, then moved to doing some Kotlin, and for the past year, he's actually back into Groovy uh, <laughs> because he's using it for uh, things like uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery with uh, Jenkins the via the, the job DSL. Uh, so he had a, a few uh, tweets on that. And uh, also, uh, um, well, so he's, he, he, he's doing some Groovy again <laughs> after a, a quick escape uh, to Scala and Kotlin. That year, uh, Spring Source was acquired by VMware, so I joined VMware, and my uh, colleagues joined VMware. And the Groovy ecosystem grew again with, um, well, some interesting projects like uh, Gpers, uh, which is our uh, l uh, concurrency parallelism uh, framework for, for Groovy. Jeb, that's uh, um, a functional integration testing tool for uh, web APIs, which I uh, really encourage you to have a look at. We also have things like CodeNARC. CodeNARC is a static code an analysis tool, a bit like FineBugs. Uh, it's a mix of FineBugs, PMD check style, etc., but specific to, to Groovy. Uh, Gmaven Plus, that's a uh, great support for uh, building Groovy-based projects uh, in Maven. 
Groovy one six, much better performance, multiple assignments, more optional returns. That's where uh, actually uh, AST transformations uh, came to be uh, popular. The grape system for um, uh, getting dependencies easily with a, a simple annotation. Then GUI 1.7, uh, we borrowed the, the power assets uh, from the Spock framework. And power assets, that's the nice um, way of doing assets in Groovy, where you see all the values of the sub-expressions of the, the expression that you are asserting. asserting. Uh, what else? Yes, some uh, things like uh, customizing the Groovy truth. Well, that's cool for politicians and lawyers and guys like that. Um, and also some support for uh, helping auth or developers author AST uh, transformations with the AST viewer and AST builder. In 2010, uh, the year where uh, a volcano uh, wrecked uh, lots of, uh, I mean, the, all the air traffic in, in Europe and, uh, well, in the um, northern hemisphere, essentially. I was stuck for a week at the Great Conf US conference in Minneapolis because I couldn't fly back home in, in Paris, in France. Uh, that was the birth of Rat Pack, um, G Contracts for doing uh, program, um, design by contract kind of programming. 2011, uh, that's uh, yeah, the, the year of the big tsunami. We also had. Uh, Java 7, then uh, some new projects in the ecosystem like Vertex. There was a some there were some presentations about Vertex already this week. Uh, Groovy FX, that's a nice Groovy DSL for dealing with uh, Java FX. So you can uh, uh, more easily and more declaratively uh, deal with Java FX rather than you know programming the the scene, the graphics, etc. We released GUI 1.8. Uh, the, the, the key change, the, the key additions and key, uh, let's say, update to, to the syntax with the, what we call common chain expressions. So that's a way to uh, get rid of dots and parentheses uh, for the case where you have chained method calls. So A, which takes B as parameter, dot uh, C takes D as parameter, etc. You, you chain method calls like with fluent APIs. Um, you, you often see that in uh, libraries these days. And that's the ability to drop the dots and parents, and which makes very, very readable DSLs in Groovy, uh, because you can almost write plain English, or French, or whatever language, plain English sentences uh, without much punctuation. Uh, so you can really write things which uh, yeah, just look like uh, normal sentences, uh, which don't look like programming, um, you know, with semicolons, with parentheses, and so on. So it's uh, one of the very nice features, uh, which make uh, the, the Groovy syntax very flexible and malleable, uh, so that you can write domain-specific languages. Uh, some more s uh, tweaks to the Groovy closures. Yeah, the built-in JSON support. So we we since the, the beginning of the project, we had great XML support, but I mean, these days, most web APIs, etc., are uh, actually preferring JSON over XML. So we added uh, support for, for uh, JSON as well. My friend Cédric Champeau joined uh, the Groovy team. Uh, we moved the project to GitHub. Uh, before we were um, uh, the, the sources were on the Codehouse uh, repository, the Codehouse Foundation, but I, I'll come back to Codehouse later on. In 2012, um, the Higgs boson was, fo was found, and the uh, the Groovy uh, ecosystem continued to grow. And uh, I'd like to mention a few interesting projects uh, uh, by you know, companies which are quite well known, like LinkedIn or Netflix. Uh, LinkedIn uh, created a project called Glue, uh, which they use for deployment, uh, continuous deployment of their uh, infrastructure. So Glue is a Groovy DSL, once again, a Groovy domain-specific language. Netflix, they created Asgard, which is actually a Grails application for uh, uh, dealing with their Again, deployments on the uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon AWS uh, cloud. Uh, <coughs> they also um, 
This one is, inter is interesting, the, the Zool uh, project, that's uh, a kind of routing uh, framework and library which defines groovy rules uh, to root uh, requests. So actually what's interesting with that project is that um, I think now Netflix has like uh, 50 or 60 million customers worldwide and each time uh, you know, a, um, a, a customer is doing a request to view uh, a video, uh, it's going to be rooted through some groovy logic. So each time you watch something on Netflix, that's going through groovy code. And that makes uh, uh, Zool and Netflix probably the, the biggest uh, web scale uh, deployment of groovy to date, uh, because they are, you know, pretty much every day, like uh, several and several millions of consumers. Uh, they don't know they are using Groovy, but actually the, the when they request a, a video on the Netflix platform, that's going through some Groovy code. Um, some other cool projects, uh, GrooScript, the GS logo that you see here, uh, that's um, GrooScript is a, um, a transpiler to transpile and transform Groovy code into JavaScript. So if you want to target JavaScript, you can use GrooScript to uh, translate Groovy into JavaScript code. GVM, now called uh, SDK Manager, uh, it's a nice and handy tool for dealing with all the SDKs that you are using. So if you're using the, the Groovy SDK, Grails SDK, Gradle SDK, Vertex SDK, uh, now there's support for uh, other languages, not just Groovy and uh, other frameworks and tools. And, uh, but initially, that was uh, Groovy specific. So more into the modern age, let's say, with Groovy 2. Groovy 2 all introduced static type checking and static uh, compilation. So you've got all the um, type inference uh, logic that you can find in, uh, in other static languages. Uh, advanced type inference with things like flow typing, where you see the uh, you you the the, the compiler checks um, at every step. Let's say a variable is being assigned, and see okay, now this is an instance of this, and then it's a, an instance of a subclass, etc. So it knows uh, in a very fine-grained fashion what's the actual type of something, and uh, the type inference engine is quite clever in the sense that um, it's able to infer types which are not denotable in Java. So things you cannot really express with the Java syntax. So it's more fine-grained, if you will, that, than what the, the Java language can actually represent in terms of types. Groovy 2.0 added some support for uh, most of the uh, project coin uh, enhancement from uh, Java 7. Um, so things like uh, uh, so actually the sole thing that's not supported is the, the try with resources notations. Uh, but this notation, we don't really need it in Groovy in the sense that we have lots of handy shortcut, library, uh, shortcut methods uh, which simplify the use of uh, resources, etc. So we ended up not adding it. But things like yeah, underscores in numbers, multi-catch block, etc. We added uh, all this stuff. Uh, we also introduced the Invoke Dynamic support to make Groovy pretty much uh, as fast as Java, even in dynamic mode. But of course, if you use the static compilation feature, it's just as fast as Java. So people thinking, you know, a dynamic language, so it's not just a dynamic language because it's a kind of hybrid now, but um, a dynamic language has to be slower than a, a statically compiled language, but with Invoke Dynamic, that's not really true anymore. And anyway, if there are still some hotspots where you know it's uh, slower than Java, you can still use static compilation. We also modularized Groovy a little bit. So in 2013, uh, Mr. Snowden, the whistleblower, uh, that's also, also the year where um, uh, there was a, a spin-off of uh, uh, VMware EMC uh, into Pivotal, so all the Spring stuff, Tomcat stuff, Groovy Grail stuff went into um, into uh, Pivotal. At the same time, the ecosystem continued to grow with things like uh, Grain, which is a static site uh, generator in Groovy. The first one with the little crossed bones—that's a lazy bones, uh, which is a um, project 
template system, so you can easily create a template for any kind of project, and you can customize that with uh, some groovy logic. Uh, yeah, next floor is a kind of uh, workflow system. I won't dive into uh, all of them. Groovy 2.1, uh, we continued refining the Invoke Dynamic support uh, for better performance, and there were still places which were not as fast as they, they could have been. What's uh, interesting with the, the static type uh, inference we had, the static type checker we, we, we implemented, we also allowed uh, people to create their own type checking extensions. So if you have even a very dynamic groovy domain specific language, you can make, you can create type check, custom type checking extensions which allow you to uh, create compilation errors, uh, analyze the code and create compila compilation errors, even for very dynamic code. So you won't get runtime errors, all that kind of things. Uh, you'll be able to define new compilation errors if your DSL is not following you know, the rules uh, imposed by that DSL. In Groovy 2.1, we introduced meta annotations, which is a way of regrouping annotations in one single annotation, uh, because sometimes there are you know, frameworks which uh, rely perhaps a bit too much on annotations, and sometimes it's a bit like you know, annotation-driven development. You've got a, a class of uh, five lines of code, but you've got ten lines of annotations. You, know? you see what I mean? And uh, sometimes there's a pattern where you reuse a certain set of annotations all the time, like let's say on, on your domain classes, you might be having three, four annotations that you use all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can regroup them with a meta annotation. So it's your own annotation, but which uh, uh, regroups uh, all, all those annotations. And the thing is that it's a, um, a compiled thing, right? So in the resulting bytecode, if the uh, um, the retention is, uh, uh, if the annotation is retained in in the in the in the bytecode, if it's not a source annotation, uh, the, the 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 class will have all those annotations which are regrouped by the meta annotation. So it's really a pure compile time thingy. Uh, to improve. Uh, how IDs understand Groovy DSLs. Uh, we also added an annotation, so it's not a transformation, but an annotation which helps the Groovy compiler know how to um, delegate certain calls within closures to some other objects. So this is a, I don't know if some of you went to, uh, to uh, Cedric's presentation on Groovy DSLs just, uh, just before my talk, but he, he gave some examples of that. Uh, what else? Yeah, we bundled Gpers 1.0. In Groovy 2.2, we added, so although uh, uh, Java 8 wasn't there with lambdas, etc., we added closure coercion to single abstract method types into uh, Groovy. So whenever you have an interface with one single method, or, uh, well, one single abstract method, not uh, you might have default methods, etc. Or if you have an abstract class with one uh, method to implement, you can actually use a closure in place of where you would have used such a sum type. So I it makes the code much more streamlined, and instead of having to do uh, things like, you know, new runnable, void run, blah, 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 you just pass a closure. Uh, well, it's not a good example because uh, Groovy closures are, are also runnable, and that's just to give you the, the, the idea. So instead of creating a, uh, an anonymous inner class, uh, you just can pass you know, a Groovy closure instead. So it's pretty much the same system as what Java 8 introduced, uh, except that uh, it's not just for functional interfaces, but it also works for uh, abstract classes as well. So it's very uh, Java Lambda friendly. So wherever you would use a Lambda uh, in Java 8 now, you can actually use a Groovy closure. I mean, when you're developing Groovy, obviously. Uh, so it's uh, the same mechanism. So it's sl a slightly different syntax because Groovy closures and Java lambdas are have a slightly different syntax, but that's pretty much equivalent. In 2014, that's the um, what's what's the name of that probe? The the Philae probe, which landed on uh, the. Uh, 
Uh, I forgot the name of the, the comet, anyway. Uh, that's the year where Java 8 was officially released in terms of the uh, Groovy ecosystem. Uh, the little Duke... Uh, Pathfinder, Pathfinder, thank you. <laughs> uh, the little duke at the bottom is uh, for a little framework called, um, uh, what is it called, Gbench, for doing some uh, micro benchmarks. And Elasticsearch decided to uh, use Groovy as the, the default scripting languages. So if you want to uh, customize Elasticsearch, you can enable Groovy. In Groovy 2.3, we added traits, so that's a bit like interface default methods in Java, in Java 8, but uh, a little bit different uh, in the sense that um, uh, it's not, uh, y well, you, you how to say that? Uh, it's a f I could make a full presentation on Groovy traits, so I won't dive into the, 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 the differences between traits and uh, default methods in interfaces, but that, that's going a little bit beyond. Um, than uh, what you can do with default methods. Uh, trade, so that's a nice way of combining uh, different, uh, it's a bit like um, interfaces with concrete uh, implementations for some of the, of the methods. And you can uh, inherit from several traits. So you can really combine uh, different behavior coming from different traits together. Um, yeah, we further improved uh, the performance of the JSON support, some new AST transformations, a new markup template engine. Uh, one of the interesting characteristics of this uh, template engine, agree, has had several template engines uh, for years, but this new one also adds uh, static type checking, static compilation support, so that you can uh, have templates which are pre-compiled and execute as fast as, uh, as possible. And that's pretty much it for Groovy, the history until, let's say Groovy 2.3, the history till, for, well, till, till the beginning of uh, this year, okay? And now let's have a closer look at what actually happened those past 10 months. First of all, um, well, the Groovy and Grails team have been fired. Pivotal decided that we were, um, how to say that politely, uh, <laughs> uh, we were um, not uh, <laughs> strategic, let's say that, <laughs> thanks for the word. Uh, it's always difficult to, to express that and still be, you know, I've got tons of friends at Pivotal, so I don't want to be uh, unfriendly with them. But yeah, they got, we got fired because they, they thought that uh, Grooving Grails were not strategic and they wanted to focus on Cloud Foundry, etc. And uh, despite Grooving Grails have always been used for things like cloud computing, for uh, uh, distributed architectures, for uh, high traffic websites, etc. Typically, um, the kind of um, settings, the, the kind of environments where Groovy and Grails were uh, cloud ready already. <laughs> uh, but well, they decided that it wasn't really, the, the, the big focus was really on Cloud Foundry, so they decided to get rid of us. However, they were uh, friendly enough to um, give us a bit of time, uh, so they decided that at the, the, the end of uh, the past year, the previous year, uh, but they gave us till March 31st to release at least uh, the, the next major versions of both uh, Groovy and uh, Grail, so we, we had some time to, to do that. But yeah, that's, uh, I'm still a bit bitter about this story. Uh, but in Groovy 2.4, a key highlight in uh, Groovy 2.4 was the, um, the Android support. So since Groovy 2.4, you can actually use Groovy to build Android applications. And one of the uh, examples I could uh, mention is the, the New York Times. They decided to uh, re-implement their uh, uh, Android application using Groovy plus Rx Java, uh, so that it's uh, much nicer to um, develop with a more concise syntax and uh, as fast as Java, basically, because uh, they use static compilation. So Groovy plus static compilation plus <coughs> Rx Java, and they were w very happy with the result. So if you uh, use the New York Times Android application, that's actually a Groovy uh, Android application. 
And uh, <clears throat> beside that, and actually also because of the Android support, we, we worked actually on things like optimizing the bytecode to make it even uh, leaner, uh, even in terms of, of size. Um, when you're on mobile devices, you also need, uh, I mean, the, the, the memory that you have available is usually, is usually smaller than you know, on server applications, typically, because that's just a handheld device. Uh, some more refinements um, in the uh, um, trade support with a specific annotation to uh, say that a trade can only be applied to certain types. That's what at self type is uh, useful for. More AST transformations and so on. So, you know, after having been fired, um, what else could possibly go wrong? You know, couldn't be worse than that, right? Actually, that's the Kudaus demise. Kudaus, the foundation which has uh, supported Groovy for the past uh, 11, 12 years, uh, um, was closing its doors. So all the project hosted there uh, had to move on and uh, go elsewhere. So we had already moved some of our infrastructure to things like GitHub, uh, but there were still quite a few things available at Codehouse, like uh, our bug tracker, like, uh, so we also had a Git mirror there, we had uh, the website, etc. So we also, in addition to losing our jobs, <laughs> trying to find a new job and having also less time to work on the project because, you know, we were hunting for a new job. <laughs> um, well, so, we, you might be wondering, you know, what's the impact on, on, on Groovy after all? Uh, what do, do you think that people would, you know, by fear of uh, what would happen to the project, perhaps people would stop using it or something like that? Not quite. So if you look back uh, at the figures, the downloads figures, for me, downloads is a is the key indicator for the success of an open source project. If you look at past figures, um, so Groovy was downloaded. Uh, almost 2 million times in uh, 2012, 3 million in 2013, 4 to 5 million in 2014, and, oh, well, 2015 is not yet over, but if you had to guess how many downloads would, uh, could Groovy get for this uh, incomplete year? Uh, less than 4.5, as much as 4.5 million, or more than 4.5 million downloads? Someone says six, lower, higher, ten. ten. Oh, that's a big, bold number. I like that. So if you look at the first ten months of 2015, we had 6.6 .6 million uh, of downloads. But it's actually Maven Central only because we moved a bit of, uh, so w th there was also some legacy downloads from Codehouse, but I don't have the figures for that. So the figure I have, uh, the figures I have is not totally complete, but you know, that's um, pretty close to, uh, I don't know if it adds perhaps another million or uh, several f uh, hundred thousand, I don't know. But we also host the binaries on Bintray from, uh, from my friends from JeffRog. And what happens if I add the numbers from Bintray, 3.3 million downloads from Bintray, plus the 6.6 .6 million, and you get almost the 10 million downloads that you mentioned. So you were the, I don't have anything to give you, <laughs> but I could have you know, given something for the winner with the closest estimation. So 9.9 .9 million uh, times that GUI has been downloaded. So compared to the previous year, I, to the previous year, and, and the year is not even over, uh, the project was downloaded twice as much, more than twice as much as the previous year. So now, what's next? Uh, first, a few words about our uh, respective uh, situations, like the um, the the core. Um, the, 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 the core GUI and uh, Grails guys w were working uh, at Pivotal. Um, so Cedric 
Jochen and myself on the Greek side, Grails, uh, we had Graham, Jeff and Larry. Uh, so we were all on the pivotal payroll and we moved to, you know, different places. Uh, moved to Restlet, Cedric and Larry moved to Gradle, Graham and Jeff moved to uh, OCI. And Jochen is going to join Canu pretty soon. That's the latest news I got. And what else? Uh, you know, we decided to... Uh, we, we could have put, you know, everything, uh, I mean, in terms of infrastructure of the GUI project, we, we could have put everything, you know, on GitHub or uh, uh, some static pages somewhere, um, use uh, uh, GitHub issues or things like that. But we decided we wanted to um, send a strong, stronger message to the, the, the Groovy community and uh, ecosystem. So we decided to join the Apache Foundation. Uh, for us, there's a, a clear message to the community here, because for us, so the the Apache Foundation is the one, is the foundation which is uh, closest to uh, our, um, you know, DNA, uh, if you will, compared to uh, some other foundations or uh, similar uh, organizations. So the, the message we wanted to send was that uh, the GUI project is here to stay, and what's nice is that the, the, the Apache Foundation also gives a certain level of independence for the project, meaning that we are not at the mercy of any commercial interest. Uh, so some committers might be paid to work full-time on, on the project, of course, that's uh, totally possible. But at least uh, the it's not because, let's say, Pivotal removes the funding of the project that the project is going to die, because uh, there's, I mean, all, all the project is going to be, you know, closed source or, or things like that. Instead, with the Apache Foundation, you know that the project is here for the long term, uh, that nobody can close the project or anything like that. And uh, one of the interesting values uh, of the Apache Foundation is also the, the community, which is a very big and important aspect of the, of the foundation. And it's something the, the Groovy team really cared uh, about. So we joined the Apache Incubator at the end of uh, March. We were lucky to have uh, some uh, great mentors to help us through this uh, process. And uh, the initial set of committers, uh, Paul King, Cedric, Pascal, Jochen, and myself. So I just uh, added the PMC chair because uh, I was just voted as the chair of the PMC of the Apache Groovy project. So now you can pretty much say Apache Groovy instead of just Groovy, if you want. So we moved um, the, the infrastructure, the mailing list, were moved to the Apache infrastructure, Jira issues as well, uh, Git. Uh, so what's interesting with Git, and especially at the Apache Foundation, is that for legal reasons, the main line, so although Git is a distributed uh, VCS, but for the, the main line, or the, the, the main code base has to be on the Git repositories from Apache. So we only have actually a mirror of that repository on GitHub. Uh, and it's not the same old project that we had uh, on, on GitHub. So we had tons of stars on the Groovy project on GitHub, but we lost all of them when moving to Apache. So if you want, you can go to the, uh, the mirror on uh, the, the GitHub mirror and uh, add a star. Please do so, <laughs> uh, so that we gain back all our lost stars. After that, uh, some new committers or past committers actually uh, joined back the project, uh, like Andres, Dirk, Russell, and uh, Keegan Witt, that's the guy behind the G Maven uh, support. Uh, Shiel, a very brand new uh, committer, a very uh, talented committer who joined the project very recently. The fol following steps, following uh, entering the incubation, uh, the, the, the we had to make a first release, right, to follow the, the Apache guidelines in terms of uh, licenses, uh, the, the how we uh, deliver the binaries and all those uh, little uh, details uh, required by the, the Apache Foundation. So we did a first try, but we, we had some further tweaks to do uh, to be really fully compliant with the Apache uh, requirements. But uh, in July 9th, we managed to release our first release with the new infrastructure. And uh, GUI 244 actually integrates a very important uh, security fix. Uh, so if you're not using GUI 244, 
if you're using an older version, please be, please be sure to upgrade. Perhaps you've heard, I think that was this week or the previous one, where uh, there was a bit of buzz about some uh, serialization, Java serial serialization issue. Uh, perhaps you've seen that uh, buzz in the, in the news where certain projects uh, were affected by uh, uh, malignant code that could be executed when uh, uh, deserializing uh, Java classes, uh, so we were affected by that problem, uh, but we fixed that uh, several months ago. So uh, there was an article on InfoQ which mentioned that Groovy was affected, but uh, only old versions of Groovy were affected. And more recently, we also released 245 with uh, w when we were uh, the, the s s most of the core Groovy team was uh, available at Java One, so we did a, a release together. And now what? Uh, so what's in Groovy 2, 4, 4, 5, 2, 5, etc.? So we continue to improve the compiler performance uh, and various improvements uh, to, s to existing AST transformations like canonical using meta annotations, etc. But uh, yeah, I have some uh, examples of that. So canonical, it's like the uh, at immutable AST transformation, which generates all the code for making uh, classes immutable. But this one is for mutable uh, classes. So it creates a, a proper equals and hash code, a proper to string method, etc., constructors and whatnot. And uh, it's actually, um, on paper, it looked like the combination of all those other transformations, but in practice, uh, the way it had been implemented, uh, that wasn't the case. So we slightly changed the implementation to make that a meta annotation, so that it's uh, somehow a synonym of uh, using all those uh, other annotations, uh, add to string, add equals and hash code, etc. Um, we uh, what else include names from to string? Yeah, so that's just showing uh, one aspect of uh, canonical, which is uh, when you pass uh, parameters inside the annotations. If there's not such a, a parameter on the meta annotation, it's going it's going to find which uh, bundle annotations requires uh, that attribute. For this uh, meta annotation capability, um, we, we have a class uh, a mechanism which is called the annotation collector, which helps bundling several annotations together. And we have more fine grain, fine grain, sorry, fine grain control on how uh, those uh, annotations are merged together. There's a new map constructor uh, to create um, named argument uh, constructor. We have, uh, what else could I tell you about that? Um, so if you're not using at immutable or at canonical, uh, you can still uh, benefit from the map constructor. But here you have some more control as well and uh, things like also compilation errors if you, if you have um, uh, errors in the uh, in the named argument that you pass to the map constructor, and another aspect uh, which is interesting with that mechanism is that there's the pre and post uh, attributes which allow you to do things at the beginning of that map constructor or after that map constructor. And yeah, I was mentioning that in relation to the map constructor, but that's also available elsewhere. Uh, in uh, AST transformations, when you have um, uh, all, all those transformations where you specify, uh, like uh, here for the autoclone transformation, you won't say, okay, uh, don't care about the surname property of that class. If you made a typo uh, to surname, uh, you would have gotten an run a runtime error. But here, uh, it's been improved so that you get a compile time error instead. Although surname is inside a string, uh, the compiler is now smart enough to figure out it should throw a compile time error rather than a runtime error. Um, the tuple constructor, there's a new parameter. Uh, so the tuple constructor generated several constructors depending on how many um, uh, parameters you pass to the constructor. But if you use defaults equals true, it only generates the, the full constructor with all the properties of the, of the class. 
the immutable class also works across the, uh, um, the, the, the class hierarchy. Uh, so uh, you can have uh, here, I have an athlete class which extends a person class. So you can actually uh, uh, make that work. Be before, uh, immutable was really only working on uh, base classes. Uh, classes extending object basically so now it also works for uh, the throughout the class hierarchy we also added uh, some new uh, methods but uh, I guess I can skip that uh, for uh, when you when you work with all the uh, things like find all collect map etc uh, so it, it's even a little bit smarter in the sense that when you have a certain type of list of uh, map, etc., uh, it's trying as much as possible to uh, wh when you use all those find all collect map methods, etc., it's trying to use the most appropriate um, uh, container class, which is the same, if possible, as the original class you were iterating over. We also improved the, uh, the compiler performance thanks to uh, a new class reader instead of relying on, on class loader uh, to do a class reading. So when you do compilation, you need to uh, read uh, all the methods available on other classes uh, that you need inside your own uh, Groovy classes. So uh, we got a nice contribution from um, someone from JetBrains um, to, to make the, the, the compiler even smarter. Well, that's uh, quite a long journey since 2003. So the, the latest news, um, and I, I'd like to also close uh, the, the, this discussion with uh, some remarks about uh, uh, open source, professional open source and so on. But in terms of the, the latest news about the, the Groovy project inside the uh, Apache Foundation, uh, so very recently we uh, uh, run the the vote for graduation. So the project management committee decided to uh, do a vote uh, to make Groovy a top level Apache project. So so far we were still only uh, an incubating project, not a full blown top level project. So the project committee uh, voted for for that. Then the incubator committee also voted for the graduation. And actually, the next step is for the the final. A decision from from the uh, Apache board to say, okay, yes, no, a Groovy can become a top-level project. So perhaps we might have to do some further tweaks that haven't been caught by the the incubator PMC, etc. But normally, perhaps even next week, uh, if not later, uh, Groovy should become a top-level project at Apache, and then you'll be able to fully call it Apache Groovy, not just Groovy, but you can keep calling it calling it Groovy. And to close with uh, some uh, remarks on open source, um, although I was a bit you know, disappointed by having been fired uh, of that dream job of working full-time on Groovy, I'm still grateful for all those companies who decided to, to, to sponsor the Groovy and Grails project. Uh, because when you're focused on the project full-time, uh, it's really not the same as you know spending your uh, weekends and nights on, the, on an open source project because you can really focus on r huge refactorings and uh, more thorough examinations of uh, the core internals of the project, etc. And uh, uh, of course, having big companies, or not necessarily big, but uh, having companies fund open source projects often help projects move faster and iterate faster feature after feature. So I'm very grateful for uh, all those uh, companies and not just Pivotal, VMware, Spring Source, but also all the other companies that let Groovy committers work even if only part time on the project. I uh, really have to be you know, grateful for, for that because it really helped uh, make Groovy such a uh, mainstream, let's say, alternative language. At least uh, that's probably the, the most uh, popular uh, alternative language uh, nowadays, uh, even if there's much, much less hype than, than before. And um, bootstrapping, what did I, I don't remember what I wanted to say about bootstrapping. Um, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> so it, it's cool to have pictures, you know, in your presentation, but uh, as I didn't put show notes, I don't remember what I wanted to say. Uh, you, I mean, you, you start a project, uh, 
you know, at, at night, weekends, etc. Uh, make it useful for your uh, use case in the company uh, you're working at or some personal projects. So it helps get the, the project started. But uh, again, to echo my, my previous remark, uh, professional open source is uh, useful for um, moving forward and uh, uh, making some, some strong progress in, in the life of a project. And sometimes the the problem you have also with projects which are uh, we, we we've got lots of external contributions from guys who are not paid to, to work at all on on Groovy, but some so it's uh, in French that's the um, uh, I don't know how it's called in uh, in English the the rabbit and the tortoise or something like that I don't know uh, I should have put a, an English title on that one. Uh, sometimes developers don't work at the same speed, basically. Uh, a full-time employee will be able to move forward more quickly than uh, a contributor. A contributor not working full-time on the project might have more difficulties following what's going on in the project. So sometimes there's a, a difference between those two kind of developers and committers, and sometimes it's make it makes uh, things a bit... Uh, harder for uh, the community to, to continue contributing easily. Um, so it's something uh, you have to be aware of when, there's a, when there are companies involved in an open source project. Um, and the last aspect I wanted to mention was that um, um, actually uh, trying to encourage people to contribute to open source projects uh, I mean, I can encourage you to join the project and submit uh, patches, etc. That's how I joined the project, actually, right? So that's how I became a, a Groovy committer, etc. And, and then led leadi uh, started leading the project in 2004. Um, but yeah, it's not um, it's not always easy to uh, to get people to contribute, and especially a project like a programming language is not something that is easy to get into. So you can work on things like the, the SDK, the libraries, etc. So it's probably the easiest part where you can contribute. Uh, but things like going into the hardcore parts of things like uh, implementing, you know, the bytecode, the, for the, 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 the bytecode generation for, for the compiler, or working on uh, the Antler uh, grammar, etc. Those parts are not ne necessarily the easiest part to contribute to. So it's not always easy, and people often start with some small bits in the, uh, let's say, in the suburbs of the, the big town that uh, is the project. And then progressively, uh, they, as they feel more at ease with the, the internal, how the, wor the project is working internally, uh, then you can actually uh, make things uh, uh, more, um, you know, ma make more uh, meaningful contributions. Right, so thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left uh, for some questions. So first of all, thanks, uh, th thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take uh, a couple of questions if you have some. Anyone over there? Uh, Spock, the Spock, yes. Yeah, so is Spock, what's the future of Spock, whether it's actively supported? So, uh, I mean, since uh, Spock 1.0, it's quite uh, major. There's not that much to add or change. Uh, something I actually would like to see is the, there, there were some work in progress uh, stuff on the on nice reports, for instance, that I'd like to see. But otherwise, I mean, Spock is... Uh, uh, yeah, I think we haven't seen a, a, a release in a while. Uh, so there, there, there were quite a few small improvements, etc., that would probably make it uh, important to, to make a release out of that. Or that could be a, a good thing. Yeah, but uh, the I don't think there's all that much activity because it's already quite major and there's not really much to add unless you see something that's worth adding to to the project. But don't hesitate to uh, also ping the uh, the the Spock team on the uh, on the mailing list to uh, to ask uh, more about that. Yeah. Another question. Yeah, in the middle top over there. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, the question of um, uh, so with uh, the loss of funding, people firing us, finding a new job, etc. If uh, we could have started um, a new company around the the groovy grails gro technologies, etc. Uh, that was definitely an option, and we even had uh, uh, even some VCs, some venture capitalists in interested in uh, in that. Um, but we felt that so. I mean, we we could make easily make a living by by just you know supporting the projects, doing consulting, training, and so on. That's uh, that's not really a problem. But we um, we wanted to if if we were to create a new company, uh, we wanted to you know create some interesting or cool product or project around that and using those technologies and projects which would really you know make a difference in our. Uh, in our field, in, in in our communities, and although we had uh, quite a few ideas, uh, there was there was already quite a bit of competition in those fields. So we felt that we, we probably need to mature our ideas a bit more before really uh, thinking about creating a new company uh, out of that. And now, I mean, everybody is spread across different companies. So I don't know if it will ever happen actually, but. Um, you know, never say never. <laughs> okay, so time's up. Thanks a lot for your attention and enjoy the rest of the show.